thank you so much for coming out on this windy, windy day over to Levine Hall to our mental health panel. Um, I'm Marie Huff. I'm the Dean of the Beaver College of Health Sciences. I could not be more excited that we're talking about this topic. And as I was just speaking to one of the panelists, we need to be talking about it, talking about it, and talking about it. One time won't do it, but I'm glad we're starting today. This topic is very near and dear to my heart. Not only am I Dean of the College of the Beaver College of Health Sciences, but I'm also a social worker. And I worked in the field of mental health, so I know what the needs are that are out there. So thank you all for coming, and I hope we can have some good conversations after it's all over with as well. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator, uh, Lauren Rinkert from the Department of Social Work. She helped talk to these panelists and get people together and help plan this, and I appreciate the work that she put into it, and I will now turn it over to Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks all, welcome. So glad to see you all. But um, we had about 128 people registered, so that was a great turnout. We're really pleased, especially for what we hope will be the first of many events to be helpful with mental health support for our students and for our faculty. So without further ado, I just want to say a few thank yous, a, a few, um, a lot, nice long list of people who helped to participate in this. Dean Marie Huff, thank you for your vision and support of this. It wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for that. Deans and departments department chairs had helped with that. I spoke with several faculty early on in the semester who helped to solidify the ideas for this. People who have mental health expertise and interests, so I've listed several folks up there um, to whom I'm very grateful for helping to make this concrete. Melissa Gutschall, thank you for the um, consultation regarding mental health foods. Melissa brought several students with her who participated in that, Christy, Anna, Bailey, Therese, and and Sharon. Um, Kevin Wilson is here from App TV in the back with the three cameras and the three students that he brought. Sam, Jenna, and Connor, thank you for being here and for um, videoing this live event for us. Um, three faculty from the social work department, Tanika and Heather and Annette, were also helpful to me. Scott Dula and the team from the dean's office, always helpful and supportive. So thank you all for that help. We're going to just kick things off. We've got a tight schedule. I'll OK, can you hear that? Is that better? Thank you. Sorry about that. I won't repeat all those thank yous. <laughs> Okay, so the overview is that we're just, um, we were recorded by App2V, so you may want to keep that in mind as we move forward. There will be questions, two or three for each panelist that you see here. I'll introduce them as we move through the program. And after we're finished with all the panelists' um, responses to the questions, if you all have questions, then there's a microphone down here in the front. You can come up to the front and ask your questions when it's time to do that. And afterwards, I'll remind you that there's a reception following, um, complete with mental health boosting foods. So I hope that you'll stay for that and more conversation with the panelists, some of whom and others from their offices will be available at a resource table for more information and conversation. So are we ready? All right. I'll start us off with Jordan Perry who is to my left. Jordan is the Director of Wellness and Prevention Services for the university. She has a master's in public health. She's a certified, master certified health education specialist, certified work site wellness specialist, and she works with the American College Association's Healthy Leadership Team. And next to her from the same office is Kira Patel. Kira is also an adjunct lecturer in the Department of Rec Management and Physical Education, so some of you may recognize her from that role as well. Um, Kira <clears throat> is the coordinator for student social wellness, wellness and prevention services, and the lead person on the recent climate survey that was um, sent out to students and uh, analyzed in the fall. She's also got a master's in public health, behavior and society, and she's a certified health education specialist. So, Jordan. We'll start with you. What do you wish we knew about um, what affects students' academic performance? Thanks, Lauren. How's the volume with this microphone? All right, cool. <clears throat> Excellent. So um, I just want to start by saying how 
grateful I am that you all are here, that you're taking time on a Friday to attend this. I mean, you know, I, you could be coming for us, but probably you're coming for the mental health boosting foods. Um, just the act of showing up shows your care for our students. And I want to acknowledge first that you are being asked to do too much. You're being asked to do too much in addition to teaching, service, research, mentorship, and more. You now have a litany of other things being added to your to-do list, some things that you didn't sign up for, and some things that you may not feel trained or equipped uh, for, specifically related to student mental health. And Lord knows you're not paid enough. <laughs> We can provide you with our perspectives and suggestions, and I would just encourage you to take what you want from what we say and leave what you don't want, because you are the expert in your experience, not us. So um, that being said, here's what I want in my perfect world with my magic wand. I want us to see students as whole people with lives outside of class. Our students are increasingly, quote unquote, non-traditional. Side note, we need some new language for that. So if you have any ideas, let me know. <laughs> and they have a lot of obligations and responsibilities outside of their class with you. At a national level, so this is national data. Kira is gonna present some data specific to our campus, but at a national level, What's impacting our students' academic performance, according to them, number one, procrastination. About 47% of them are saying they're experiencing negative effects of procrastination. So let's accept that and build some flexibility in. Because um, I don't know about you, but we do it too. I procrastinated preparing for this today. I emailed Laura this morning to ask her to change something on the slide, even though she asked for us to have that into her by Tuesday. So I think that's just a reality of our world, that some people operate like that, and maybe that's OK. So how can we build in an acceptance that about half of us are going to procrastinate? So the other things impacting students' academics, according to them, number two, finances. I'm sure you're hearing that from students. They're worried about money. Number three, they're worried about their careers or about work. And fourth, they're worried about their families. They're worried about the health of their families. They're worried about um, or have experienced the death of a loved one. Now, those stressors sound pretty familiar to me. They might sound familiar to you, too. So when we see our students as whole people, it allows us to tap into empathy that sometimes can feel a little hard to access when we're overwhelmed. Our students are dealing with almost unbelievable numbers of stress, anxiety, and depression. So just to make the numbers really simple, again, this is national level data. If you had a class of 100 students, you can expect that 79 of them are dealing with moderate or high levels of stress. 52 are experiencing loneliness. 35 have been diagnosed with or treated for anxiety. 28 have dealt with or are currently dealing with suicidal ideation. 26 have been diagnosed with or treated for depression. And 23 are in serious psychological distress. But you know these numbers because you see them every day. Now, I don't believe that this is um, an issue of resilience. And that's my personal perception or belief in this. I think our students are pursuing an education in the context of a three-year global pandemic, climate destruction, multiple wars, more than daily gun violence, murders of black and brown people by the state, and, you know, maybe a recession. I think our students are, as they would say, <laughs> resilient AF. <laughs> And they're showing up for class with us. I'm pretty impressed by that. Another thing that worries me, however, is that 54% of students nationally 
don't think that we care about their well-being. So that's a little over half. The good news is we can change that, and we can shift that pretty easily with just some simple steps. Um, the Jed Foundation, which is about suicide prevention and mental health among college students, is a really great resource for that. And they have a very specific guide um, for faculty, for things that you can do in your classes. And Sheridan, can you wave Sheridan? Sheridan is going to be out at a table um, after this in the reception with, um, she's got some printed out copies of this guide, but there's also a QR code so you can scan it and get to it. It's a really helpful guide um, and you can look at that in more detail, but broadly they say they want to see faculty support mental health in the classroom. So some examples of that include talking about campus resources like the folks you've got here, thoughtful deadlines, like avoiding midnight or early morning deadlines, consulting with your colleagues to really intentionally time when um, large assignments are due, particularly at the junior and senior levels where they're taking classes within a similar department, and allowing mental health absences. There was actually just an article in the Chronicle today about mental health absences and the power that can have. In addition to supporting mental health in the classroom, they also recommend recognizing a student who is struggling. It could be changes in behavior. It could be something they write in an assignment. I've had students submit assignments to me that talk about some of their struggles. Um, they also recommend reaching out to a struggling student, and they provide specific talking points you can use. And then they also recommend connecting students to professional help when needed. No one expects you to be a counselor, even though I think some of you actually are. <laughs> um, but we're here to help you. We want to support you. We want to um, be there for you and our students. This campus actually has really robust um, services. So bring us in. Happy to help. However, if you're feeling like talking about mental health in your classes is too much, it's not your area of expertise, or it's opening up a proverbial Pandora's box, that's okay too. You can actually get at some of this without even ever talking about mental health. Now, I want you to talk about mental health if you feel comfortable with it, but if you don't, that's okay. There are still things that you can do. And that sort of takes us to our second prompt. So how can we promote wellness and prevention before mental health? Uh, intervention is needed. So the number one thing I want to see is I want us to be working with the students we have, not the students that we wish we had. I love working with faculty. I've been adjunct faculty myself um, for many years, and I, to be honest with you, have heard faculty say pretty awful things about students, even recently and even here at App. And I know why it happens. We're venting. We have to vent. We get frustrated. We're overwhelmed. We're burned out. But I do worry that some of the stress we're experiencing is seeping into our interactions with students. We can prioritize relationships in the classroom. Research shows that there is not a conflict between relationship building and rigor. Some people are concerned about that. Um, but the research just doesn't back that up. And in fact, students will tell you that relationships with faculty, staff, and other students um, can really improve their educational experience. We can also infuse well-being into the curricula. Kira and I are actually leading a workshop um, through CEDLs on February 23rd from 12.30 to 1.30 via Zoom. So if you want to know more, you can come to that workshop and we'll tell you a little more. We'll go into more detail at that workshop, but really broadly speaking, some strategies for infusing well-being into the curriculum include establishing a welcoming course environment and encouraging what's called psychological safety. Many of you may be familiar with that already. And implementing course practices that make well-being easy. I like to call it spinach in the smoothie. You take the vegetables and you hide them inside, right? So nobody even knows they're there. And then embedding well-being into course activities or course content. Um, there are activities that you can build in that get students thinking about well-being without you having to be the one who's talking to them about, about well-being. 
And then the final one, hardest one, you gotta practice while being yourself. Easy, right? Get right on that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kira to talk about some of our campus specific numbers. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, next slide. So, so as Jordan mentioned, they had shared a lot of statistics on a more national level. Well, here at App, we do a health and wellness campus climate survey, and we've done this every other year for the past eight years. So we have a lot of data related to students' health and wellness behaviors. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, some of the data that we've collected, and then some of our responses as well. So this assessment, we've got those four years of data. Questions have changed a little bit over time, but it's really nice to see how those trends have played out over time. So we're able to compare pre-pandemic data to now and so on. Um, but this year, we collected 1,426 responses. You can see it up there. Um, we sent them out through an anonymous link. We used IRAP. And, but most of this came from in-person tabling. So if you were in the union and you saw a student yelling at other students saying, come do my survey, I'll give you a free t-shirt, that was my student. <laughs> and it works, students love free things. But we got 844 responses from it, so I think it works pretty well. Um, and you can see the breakdown up there. I'm not gonna go super in depth with that because they are there and you're gonna be sent these slides after this as well so you can look yourselves. Um, but this survey covers a wide variety of health and wellness topics. So we talk about alcohol and marijuana use. We talk about alcohol. We talked about alcohol use at football games. Um, so we were able to use some grant funding to fund some incentives from this. Uh, we talked about prescription drug use, recovery, mental health, sleep, stress management, anxiety, food insecurity, financial well-being, and more. So a lot of things that you would want to know about our students' health behaviors are included in this survey. So if you're interested, come talk to me and we'll talk more about data. Um, so I wanna go a little bit in depth with some of these numbers. So Jordan mentioned that financial well-being is one of those stressors that students face. So we asked questions about financial insecurity and food insecurity. So as you can see here, in the past 12 months, we asked students, have you had significant concerns regarding your personal finances? 39% said yes of the 1,300 students that responded. And then we asked about food insecurity. So again, in the past 12 months, have you worried about where, sorry, have you worried you would run out of food while lacking the means to acquire additional nourishment? 19%. Every year that we've done this survey, it's around 19 to 22%. So that has not changed in the past eight years. I think that's a pretty interesting statistic. And then we asked about how often do you consume raw fruits and vegetables? Most of the students said sometimes to often, thank goodness. But what's really unique about this survey, oh, nope, go back, go back. Um, we were able to do some additional filtering. We did this all in Qualtrics. It was very cool. Never done that before with this. But we found that students are who are experiencing financial insecurity are twice as likely to experience food insecurity. So when Jordan's talking about looking at the student as a whole, one thing that they may be struggling with is gonna impact everything else. If they don't know where their next meal is coming from, they're probably not worried about turning in that assignment but are we setting up a space in our classroom where they're comfortable coming to us? So I am an adjunct instructor. I teach personal and family health. It's a gen ed wellness class. It's great for students who don't want to take two PE classes. <laughs> and I inherited the course and went through all the content. And one of the assignments on there was asking students to track their food intake over three days. It's a pretty common assignment that you may have seen in nutrition classes and PE classes. That's actually a really damaging assignment, um, especially for students who are struggling with eating concerns, and they may not feel comfortable coming to you and telling you that. 
so we can take a look at the assignments that we're even offering students say like how is this going to actually impact them and what am I getting out of it as a faculty member if I'm asking them to track their food intake what can I switch that out to to make it helpful for all of us so I instead link all my assignments to a resource on campus I'm like tell me more about this go to a um, Go to the food hub, go to university recreation, take a class, or make one of the recipes in our student cookbook. Connecting them to a resource and having them reflect on it. So I'm letting them know, like, I'm here, I know the resources, I know how to connect you to those resources, and I want you to know that as well and build that skill. The next slide is going to talk a little bit about mental health, why we're all here today. These are very interesting numbers as well. So in the past 12 months, have you experienced feelings that you perceive as recurring, overwhelming anxiety that lasted six months or longer? 50% said yes. So that's pretty on par with those national averages, but that's not great either, right? Sometimes it's good to be on par with national numbers, but when it comes to your mental health, that's not a great place to be. And then we also ask them, you know, in the past 12 months, have you experienced feelings that you perceive as recurring depression that lasted two weeks or longer? And 44% said yes. It's a lot of students when you take these numbers and compare it to a campus of 20,000. So while you may be thinking, well, it's only 1,400 students, based on the number of students that we got and the breakdown of their demographics, it's representative. So that's a lot of students that are going through this. And it's important that we build in that well-being practice, those well-being practices into our coursework, into the work that we do, how we have conversations with students. Um, and the last question we asked was, you know, in the past seven days, how often do you get seven to nine hours of sleep? Right? How many of us do that? Probably not a lot. But those are the CDC guidelines. That's what's recommended for college-age students. And 23% said they were getting that six to seven days a week. So a lot of our students are not regularly getting enough sleep. So Jordan talked about maybe not making our assignments due at 11 p 11.59 p.m. Are you really grading at 11.59 p.m. or are you grading Monday morning? Are those two days really gonna make a difference? Or could we give them those two extra days over the weekend, let them get some sleep, it's not going to change what I'm grading, but it's going to give them that time to really focus on themselves as well. Um, doesn't impact me, but it's going to impact them. And it's an easy well-being practice to just incorporate into your class. And then next slide. So I wanted to make sure I was doing this right. And so we know with national data that there's a relationship between sleep and depression and anxiety. So if we know that majority of our students are not getting enough sleep, that's gonna impact their depression and anxiety. So students who get six to seven days of sleep, that's seven to nine hours, are less likely to experience anxiety. And the same thing can be said about depression. So sleep impacts their mental health. There's simple things that we can do to help them with this. Um, moving forward, we're hoping to use some embedded data that we have with this survey to really break this down. We ran into some issues, so more to come on that. Um, but if you're interested, we can break it down by academic college to see how your college compares to others. We can break it down by race, gender, the year in school, the number of credits they're taking, everything, because we had them sign in. So anything that this school collects based on that login can be embedded into this. So some really useful data in this that you can use to help improve your well-being practices in the classroom. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like next to introduce Tandria Carter. Tandria is the director of counseling for faculty and staff with the Blue Cross um, with the 
Blue Cross Blue Shield Institute for Health and Human Services. She's been there in that role since 2010. She's also a licensed psychologist, and since 2020, she's been the university ombud. So Tandria has had a lot of experience in working with and supporting faculty and staff, and I asked her here today so that she could give us a perspective on our own self-care and our own well-being. Tandria, your first question is, how do you think faculty, staff, and student mental health interface? Well, um, first of all, I just wanted to um, thank you all for considering the impact of mental health concerns on employees, on faculty and staff, because I think when you think about that interface, if we are the ones receiving that and trying to support um, students, how is that perhaps impacting us? And then, of course, how can we take care of ourselves? So I think it's just wonderful that that, that consideration was, was put up front because we really are the human capital that enacts the university's educational mission. And as people, we have demands that we are, we are facing. We have our own feelings, we have our own needs, we have our own priorities. So obviously we're not machines, we're, we're human beings. And so supporting other people, of course, impacts us. So I just um, have a few notes and we'll weave in a few statistics. Um, so I guess the first thing that I would say is that oftentimes supporting people in distress is challenging. Um, and of course, you know, the extent to which we're exposed to mental health concerns or challenges that students are facing can vary. So, and I know Jordan, you, you know, mentioned some of this in terms of how we might find out. Uh, so that we, you might have a student who's formally doing well, high performing, very engaged, and you start to see the student exhibiting signs of distress or disengagement. Um, sometimes students will talk uh, with us about their challenges. Sometimes students will share information about their mental health challenges in the work that they might submit, like in an assignment. Um, and of course, some of us may tend to have more exposure to students who are uh, in distress. And it was an interesting statistic that I saw, um, talked about graduate students in particular, showing a rate of depression six times that of the general population. <laughs> So some student populations may be in particular, may be particularly impacted by mental health concerns and that therefore may impact how they engage with us as well as their progress through programs. And then of course, as I said, we're human beings. Um, so faculty and staff are also experiencing, we're experiencing our own challenges, mental health challenges and stressors. So just a few statistics. So uh, in a 2021 study, nearly half of Americans surveyed reported recent symptoms of an anxiety or depressive disorder. Um, and of course, when we think that's Americans in general, so then when we think about um, faculty and staff, uh, recent survey, more than 50% of faculty respondents reported a significant increase in emotional drain and work-related stress. 21% um, in a different study, faculty and staff agree that supporting students in mental health and emotional distress has taken a toll on their own mental health. Um, and also within that same sample, 9.5% um, of faculty and staff screened positive for symptoms of major dis depression, dis depressive disorder based on the PHQ-2. So just to say that part of that interface is not only is it challenging sometimes to support um, students who are struggling, but some of us are also experiencing our own challenges. Um, and then of course, Students' mental health, as um, you know, Jordan um, and Kyra talked about, it impacts how they engage in the educational mission of the university. So you might notice changes in terms of attendance, grades, student progress, engagement. And how does that impact us? Well, because we care about students and their, and their progress, when we see people struggling, that impacts us. And I also think about a number of conversations that I've had, especially during the pandemic, with faculty and staff members who also see that dissing student disengagement and they start to question themselves. Like, am I not doing enough? I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to reach people, but it feels like I'm not. Or am I no longer being effective in my work? And it can also, um, you know, cause us to question ourselves and it can also impact um, our satisfaction with our work when we feel like we're putting out the effort, but maybe it's not landing or, or um, it's not meeting the mark. Um, 
And so another, you know, recent study talked about, you know, that 83 percent of students um, especially during the pandemic, said that mental health had impacted their academic performance. So certainly faculty members will see that not only in through direct conversations, but I'm sure many people have seen sort of waves in terms of student engagement and maybe wondered how mental health might be a factor in that. And so that certainly impacts us as well. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead with the of second course, sure. question? Yes. So um, the second so I'll question. Go, I'll yes. read it out. Sorry. Okay. How can we take care of our own mental health while supporting students? So another great question. Um, so one of the things that I thought about, um, a term that I've heard before and that it also resonates with me in terms of the work that I do, is the idea of caring without necessarily carrying. You know, caring for people without necessarily carrying that entire burden. And I appreciate um, what Jordan said about resilience. And I think, you know, not to talk too much about myself, but that actually was what spurred me to study psychology, to become a clinical psychologist. I remember when I was working in New York City and working with, and I was absolutely green as grass and, you know, didn't know what I was doing and um, trying, to, working in human services positions um, and working with people that, you know, I was like, I'm not sure how, based on this person's life experiences, I'm not sure how this person is actually sitting across the table from me. So yes, the person had a substance abuse issue, you know, the children, you know, our children may have been in, in foster care and had a, had a criminal uh, justice history and concerns, um, but yet that person was actually there. Um, and so what it really brought front and center for me is just that, natural inclination of humans towards resilience. And I know that that can be dimmed sometimes in people. But to me, you know, for me seeing my role as supporting that resilience, sort of helping to plant the seed, sort of helping to um, encourage that resilience. So it's not that I would need to save someone, but what can I do to support that person's natural striving? And so I think about that idea of having empathy, but not necessarily taking on um, all of some, all of the weight of somebody else's concerns. So having empathy and boundaries. Um, I also think about, you know, as we're absorbing and taking on people's concerns, receiving people's concerns, that we have a place to share those. Um, so certainly, if it's a resource within the university community and we can direct a student to get the help that they that they need, absolutely, that's what we need to do. But also getting support from a chair or colleague when that that weight feels really heavy for you. Um, seeking support when you need it. Another uh, idea that um, is important to me in terms of my role as a counselor is that idea of me, not me. And it's not that you're pushing someone away, but you have your perspective, you have your experiences, and that person has their perspective, their feelings, and their experiences. So you're communicating and you're connecting, but you know, you're not necessarily absorbing all of what is kind of coming your way. So I think that that can be helpful to maintain that empathy and that engagement, but also know that that other person has their part and, they, and that you have your part as well. And so you're trying to help connect someone to the resources that, that they need. I also think about self-care. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to, to define what that means means for us. And so one term that I think of is that idea of one step better. So I often encourage people to think about like what is one thing that you might want more of in your life? So it's not that you can snap your fingers and all of a sudden everything is the way you want it, but if you wanted more creativity in your life, what would be one step towards that? Or if you wanted more peace in your life, what would be one step towards that? More connection, more support, a greater sense of purpose, more sleep as we talked about. So what would be one step towards that? You know, it could be, you know, I want a sense of peace in my house. House and you know there used to be a time that I used to play music and now it's just a TV in the background or the news and it's depressing you know so could you use your smart speaker to play music or you know have a playlist that you listen to so just thinking for ourselves what would one step be in that direction and then prioritizing ourselves and taking that step I also think about uh, working with our expectations the expectations that we have for ourselves sometimes things feel hard because they actually are hard it's not that we're failing it's 
it's not that we're not enough, it's that it's more than what we can do. And so I think even that mindset can be helpful in terms of keeping ourselves encouraged and moving forward, valuing our effort and our intent and not just the outcomes. I think also boundaries around work can be helpful. Um, so when do we work and when do we allow ourselves to actually be off? How do we, when, you know, responding to emails, those, those kinds of things, considering those boundaries. Um, increasing support and connection can be very helpful in terms of uh, um, nurturing our own men mental health. And I also think finally, um, investing in our lives outside of work. So, um, you know, work is very important, our careers, the things that we do for students, the things we do for our colleagues. Um, but also thinking, how can we make our lives, again, one step better? Then finally, I also want to think about resources. So certainly, my office, Counseling for Faculty and Staff, is a resource for employees. So we provide individual counseling for employees um, and their immediate family members. We also do couple and family counseling. Um, we have classes and workshops. We have you know regular series of workshops that we provide, but we also do targeted workshops if someone, if an office says it would be helpful to talk about work-life integration or something about balance or something about meditation or stress management, you know, we respond to those requests and are happy to collaborate to create something. Um, we also will refer people to employees to resources in the community. Not everyone might want to work with us for uh, counseling and support services, and we certainly understand that. So, for example, you know, with our state health plan, many of the providers in our area, the clear pricing providers, there's a zero copay for mental health services. And then for other in-network providers, there's a $25 copay. So we do whatever we can to help people connect to the resources we also think about health promotion for faculty and staff, which is also part of the Institute for Health and Human Services. Um, exercise, there's a lot of research that shows how important that can be and how helpful that can be for your mental health. And one of the things I really appreciate about health promotion for faculty and staff is they meet you wherever you are. You know, if it's individual classes, personal training, you don't have to identify as an athlete to participate in those services and, and get that support as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Tandria. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to introduce Martha Marking. Martha is the faculty chair for the Early Intervention Team. She's going to tell you a little bit about that program. She's also a professor in theater and dance, former chair of the Faculty Senate, a recipient of the Plemons Leadership Medallion, the Board of Governors College Teaching Award, and several Outstanding Service Awards. So Martha, take it away. So I really feel like a poser, <laughs> given everyone else that's on this panel, but uh, hopefully you can relate to what I have to say because you are me, right? Um, so um, a couple of things um, are my, the three questions that um, I was asked is what do we wish we knew and um, I will generally just tell you about the early intervention team process it's not as suspicious and, and underground as you might think it is but I'll just tell you what happens when you make a referral um, I will tell you that we have about 25 faculty and staff on campus that are volunteers doing this work this is half of my teaching load I will tell you I put in way more than half of my teaching time doing this, but we do have 25 people on the team. Are any of them here today? Yeah, um, yes, my co-chair Chanel Frisco is here. Please stand up, let us Chanel get in. And, um, and Chanel's an academic advisor. And then Kendra Sousa is a master's in social work student. She's working with me, thankfully, this year. Um, so that's great. And in addition to the volunteers, we meet weekly. Scott Dula is the person that we meet with that comes from the Counseling Center each week. Andrew Lail comes from the Dean of Students Office each week. So we have support within our group and we kind of talk about who's going to take this, who's going to, you know, where does it land? <clears throat> so a couple of things. I want you to know that we're here to help. Um, we sometimes do, sometimes I get uh, information from faculty and they say, oh, I'm really surprised to get this. The students have got really good grades. It's not about grades. It's about many other things. Um, what we find sometimes 
is students, for example, that have really good grades, maybe shared something with one of their faculty members and they're doing okay in everybody else's class, but then cracks start appearing and you start seeing that they're getting tearful or their other things are starting to appear in your class. I'm hoping that because we were, you know, we sent you something that you will later on say, you know, when I reported last, this person was doing fine, but now I'm seeing that there are some concerns. Maybe they felt comfortable sharing that with one faculty member that they knew better than others. So, um, so just know that there are no expectations about what we are hearing or what we are seeing. We're just trying to get the information. Um, <clears throat> to tell you what the process looks like, I'll get a referral. I look at the student's transcript to see if there are um, several semesters of poor academic performance. Have they been on probation? Have they changed their major several times? You know, I try to look at that holistically. Um, we will, uh, and then I all, also, then we send an email to every faculty member that student has and their academic advisor. The, you know you've gotten them from me. If you've, you're, you probably get more of these than you want to hear. But um, we're just, I'm not going to tell you what the concern is, but I do want you to share. If you don't have anything to share, that's totally fine. If you would just re respond and say, everything's fine, I, I don't have any concerns, that's great. I'm not trying to manufacture concerns that are not there, okay? Um, I would like to tell you also that um, we are not punitive. Now we will, you know, in our process, so we meet every Monday, we talk about the students, and if we decide we need to meet with the students, we send the students two letters to meet with us. We'll send them a letter that's saying, hey, we're the early intervention team, we're just concerned faculty and staff members that care about you, and then if they don't respond in two days, we send them another letter saying, hey, you didn't respond, and now we're going to put a hold on your registration. And it seems punitive to do that, but sometimes we need to get their attention to get them to talk to somebody. Sometimes in our process, they get referred to us. The dean of students decides they're going to take care of the student, and then the student doesn't reach back to the dean of students. So then the dean of students says to us, why don't you try to meet with them because you can put a hold on their accounts, right? So it isn't punitive, but we need to get their attention to see if we can help them make some decisions, try to get them to resources that will help them. Um, I would also say please respond in a timely r manner. Again, we meet every Monday, so like it's kind of a clearinghouse in my world. Like every Monday, I bring whatever information we have on that Monday. The other thing I'd like you to know is know that our process is fluid. Scott and Drew and Jasmine, we talk, and Chris, we talk back and forth multiple times a day, multiple times a week. What do you know? What do you know? What do you know? Who's going to, you know, we, we will get it to the person. If you make a referral to Dean of Students and it doesn't rise to their level, they will alert me it will, if it rises to our level. If it's just purely academically um, attendance related, I may refer it to the Office of Student Success. So you know, just know that it's most important to refer and we will work within our groups to get it to whoever needs to know that information. Um, <clears throat> so we will automatically meet with a student if they've had two or more um, semesters below a 2.0. Even if they seem to be doing fine and they got a flag in one class, we'll automatically meet with them. If a student is doing great and they say they have mental health concerns, we will automatically meet with that student. Um, if two or more people corroborate whatever the first concern is, we will automatically meet with that student. Right, So you may be the only one that has a concern about that student. We may or may not meet with that student. If they do say it's mental health, we will definitely try to meet with that student. Okay, The flaw in this process is students don't always check their emails. Um, you might reach back to me and say, hey, I haven't heard anything from this student. I haven't seen this student. Like we have tried to send them an email and it's really up to them to kind of filter through that and say, okay, I really need to reach back to these people. So that's what I wanted to say about that. The other thing I wanted to say is 
when I talk to faculty and they say, could you please do a wellness check on the student? I want you to know if a student lives on campus, it's, it's fairly much easier to get a wellness check done. I can contact, or through Jasmine's office, I can contact um, the housing people and ask RAs to check in or RDs or somebody. If a student is an off-campus student, what that means as a campus is we are sending law enforcement to their door. So just know that, like, Jasmine's not going to go to their door, Chris is not going to go to their door, I'm not going to go to their door. It's going to be the Sheriff's Department or Boone Police or something like that. So when you say, I would like a wellness check on this student, just know that that's a serious ask, okay? And <clears throat> so that's all I wanted to say about that. So my second question is, what concerns lead to referrals? And we have a whole list of them out in the um, foyer. They're on a flyer that I have. But it, some of the things I could mention are excessive class, class absences, sleeping in class, noticeable decline in academic performance, change in appearance, are they looking more disheveled, are they losing weight? Um, do they have in, inappropriate or extreme changes in mood? Are they tearful? Do they have evidence of potential harm to themselves? Are you noticing cuts or bruises on their arms or burns? Um, perceived evidence of threat to themselves through their writings or verbalizations. Uh, perceived evidence of threat to others, writings or verbalizations. And un any other um, unusual behaviors that should be addressed. Sometimes the faculty will say, oh, the student is really disruptive in my class. And I will say, well, contact student conduct first and see they can maybe help you work through maybe what that student is going through in your class and then maybe they can answer questions about the behavioral address. You know, especially if I don't see it in other people's classes, I'm not going to say to that faculty member, oh, you're the only one that had the concern, but I will address everyone to go to student conduct if that's the kind of behavior that's there. Um, the third um, the third question is, and then, you know, so look at our website. We have a lot of information on our website. The third question I had is when and how should we make referrals to EIT? On the Early Intervention Team website, there are a series of, like, stop signs in different colors, and there's, like, yellow, uh, which is, like, basically referring to the student to the early attendance alerts. Um, EIT is the orange marker, and that means um, attendance plus other personal concerns. Um, there is a link on the Early Intervention Team website for you to fill out and um, get us the information. I may reach back to you and say, I, you know, could you give me more information about this? I'm not, you know, I want to make sure I understand what I'm reading. Um, and then, um, uh, let me see. And then the other things I want to say is, you know, if a student starts missing several consecutive classes, one thing I want to do is put back on you to for you to reach out to the student. Please do your best to reach out to the student first. They may respond to you more quickly because you're one of their faculty members. The other thing that we've noticed is if you tell a student, I notice you haven't been there, they may be more likely to come back to class, right? They want to know that you noticed that they weren't there. So, so as soon as you mention, you know, if they miss one or two classes, you know, it's it might not be all that important, but you don't know. We really don't know. Um, the students may or may not know they've been referred to us. We may, again, just send them a list of resources. We may decide to meet with them. You could tell them that you referred them. That would be fine. Um, but again, please don't refer a student and say, oh, they're going to reach out to you, because we may or may not. It might be the dean of students. Somebody else might be reaching out. We might decide, well, they have really good grades. We didn't really notice anything. No one else corroborated what you were feeling. But we, and then in our list of referrals, we volunteer to meet with the student. Like, if you would like to meet with us, we would love to meet with you. Um, so, so that's um, the infor uh, information. When you make a referral through the early intervention, team link, you'll get an automatic confirmation saying, please, you know, we got your information so you know that we did get it. You will not hear back from me. Uh, for as an example, last semester we had 359 referrals. Um, during COVID, we had a high of like 589 referrals. Like if you're really concerned about a student, I could email, like you, if you emailed me, I could say, well, we have met and we're hoping that the student's going to respond to us. I can kind of give you that 
that, but I will personally not be able to follow up with each of you and say this is where it is, right? Um, so, so the other thing I just want to say is it's always better to make a referral. Please don't refer to Dean of Students, Office of Student Success, and the Early Intervention Team because we are all going to be spinning our wheels in our different wheelhouses and we're not going to know, oh, that person was referred to me. Again, if, if it gets referred to Dean of Students and it doesn't rise to their level, they will send it to me. So I will get that information. So, I mean, for example, this week I had one faculty member or several faculty members that referred to Office of Student Success and EIT. And then, you know, so then we were trying to go back and forth about, you know, just refer to one place and just know that it'll get pushed in different directions, whichever way it needs to go. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Martha. I'd like to introduce Jasmine Taro. Jasmine is the Assistant Dean of Students. She's the Director of the Case Management Program in that office. She has a Master's of Arts in Education, Adult Education and Training, and she has a Master of Science in Psychology. All set? All right, you have three questions there. The first one is, what do we need to know? Hi, everyone. <laughs> So it's kind of funny as I'm thinking about like all the things I was going to say or I'm still going to say to you anyway. Um, a lot of it's going to be repetitive because all the things everyone's discussed right here on this panel today, they are so very, very important. And a lot of our offices overlap on a regular basis. So the things you need to know, especially about students, I'll cover one piece, I guess, that has not been covered already, is how they're trying to connect with you as faculty and what... What, kind of like a metaphor I shared with Lauren before it was um, their way of connecting with you maybe just kind of just trauma dumping. They're going to share everything with you. And they're going to tell you like, you know what, you know, I know this is my second day in this class. And so I'll let you know, when I was five, I fell on the stairs. And then my mom, she called me. Then my little sister, she saw me. And then she started crying. And they're just going to start sharing everything from as far back as they can remember until about right now. And I know it sounds dramatic, but it's real. Because I have read a lot of referrals that have had that kind of information in them. And they're going to keep going, keep going. And to the point you're standing there looking at them like, oh, maybe I should refer you to somebody. But maybe you really don't. The thing is they're sharing that with you because they're trying to connect with you. That's how they're sharing half of their donut. They're like, great, now I told you about my entire life story. You're probably gonna pay me just a little bit. Maybe you'll give me an A or a B if I'm on that teetering edge of a B or a C, but now you know my life and I want you to know me. So this is how I'm going to share this with you. So when they do that with you, you don't need to refer them necessarily. Sometimes, like I said, it's just they're trying to connect with you. And it's kind of hard, you figure, with the pandemic that's been going on for a long time now. It feels like a decade. And it's been a really hard time for people to connect, especially if they haven't already hit the point in their life where they have multiple friend groups. They have different mediums to connect through um, outside of social media. So this is their way of connecting with you. It's been so long since they've been in the classroom, or now that they're back in the classroom, they're like, great. I know I need to make a name for myself. This is how I'm going to talk to you about different things. Um, something else I need you to know is that even if you were to like send someone to our office and you don't necessarily need a referral. I know that's kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but you don't need to refer someone necessarily. You don't need to like a formal way of doing that. If you tell them about case management, it's like, hey, you know, there's a team out there that can kind of help you sort out some things. It sounds like you're navigating a lot right now. You can just send them to our office. You can just tell them, hey, here's our website. Here's the, this is where they're located in the student union on the third floor, suite 324. There's different ways of kind of getting them to us without necessarily just telling them like, hey, you know, I'm gonna make a referral and someone's gonna reach out to you because that's not always true. Um, if you do make a referral and kind of like what Martha was saying, if it were not to meet our threshold, because um, we usually deal with like serious and severe concerns or the student that's kind of stuck. And when I say that, you know, you, sometimes you get so far in your life and you all may remember some of you kind of there now possibly. You get so far, you're just like, I don't, I, I don't know what to do anymore. Like, I think I still want to major in this. I think I want to go here after, after work. I don't know what, what I'm going to do today. And they just start kind of flailing all over the place. Send them to us. Yes, they're flailing. They're kind of getting stuck. They're starting to spiral. And we've seen those spirals kind of go from just like one spot to going all the way down. Send them to us. 
And for the ones that have more like the severe concerns or the really serious concerns, a lot of times we navigate um, student issues that involve like thoughts of suicide or maybe even an attempt that has happened before once in our life. Or maybe they're dealing with so many family concerns back at home that you can't even see because they're in your class, they're trying to be present, they're trying to listen to you and read 5,000 slides you got on the screen. They're like, great, yeah, I'm here. I took the notes, great. And then they failed the test, but they've been there every day, but they're struggling. And those are like the invisible struggles that you can't see, but it doesn't mean that they don't need your help. If you see those things happening, yes. Sit down, talk to them for a second, refer them if you need to, or if I had some faculty that even just walk a student over to our office, that's great. Although we, I don't necessarily have the manpower to have someone just kind of meet with them immediately, like maybe heck, we can spare like five or 10 minutes in between our own meetings, we will schedule them to meet with us for a whole hour, like leave later that day or the next day. So no matter what the student is telling you, just, just listen to them. Figure out what's going on and then just kind of decide like where they kind of need to go or maybe how you should refer them or what maybe what's happening in their life. And keep in mind too that just because they're telling you something that maybe you navigated once in your life, um, their problem is not the same as yours. Just because you failed calculus class, I mean, actually I did, um, just because you failed it doesn't mean they're about to fail. Or if they're failing it, it's not for the same exact reasons. Other things are happening in their life. And they just remember that too, that yeah, although this is their full-time job to be here, this is their full-time job to be a student, a lot of our students have multiple roles in their life. They're also a full-time worker. They're a part-time worker. They're a babysitter. They're a daughter. They're a brother. They're a cousin. They're an uncle. All those different things, and all those roles overlap. So many of our students are responsible for their family back at home. Some of them are sending them money back at home. Some of them are rushing home after school because they have to take care of grandma because she's She's not doing well, but they can't afford hospice. So it's their job to get there and relieve their mom so they can go over there and take care of them. And then about midnight, they start their homework. And then about 9 a.m., they show back up in your class. It's been a long day. It's been a long night for them. So remember these things when they're kind of navigating so many different issues. There's a lot happening. And even a little bit more than they probably anticipated, they thought, like, I'm going to go to college. It's going to be great. I'm going to meet new friends. Some of them don't make friends at all. So there's so many different layers about what's going on in their own personal life that's impacting them while they're here at App State. All right. What concerns you about us? So many things. <laughs> <laughs> I am concerned that some of you are taking on so much more than you need to. And I know Tandria and Martha, everybody's actually talked about this too, like self-care, taking care of yourself. I'm concerned about those moments where you've sat down and talked to a student and they trauma dumped on you and they actually told you something that was happening right here in this moment, like, ooh, that's bad. But you decided instead of maybe referring them, I got three hours to spare, let's, uh, let's talk about this. And let me get four more of my colleagues in this room too. And we're gonna sit down and just get to the bottom of this right now. And then maybe I'll refer them to somebody else after those four hours are over. Over. That's too much. That's too much. You have a life. Enjoy that life, really. You should also have boundaries, too. I think all of us as professionals or growing professionals have those boundaries. But also learn that if you talk to a student and something's happening at that moment, like, okay, great, you navigated it, you figured out. The main issue is like, okay, they're struggling in class, but why? because of family issues. Okay, so your, your mom has cancer. Okay, you've been going home every day after school to like help take care of her. Okay, you need support. At that moment, it's, like, it's okay to let them know like, hey, are you open to me referring you to someone? I feel like the case management team in the Dean of Students office will be a great support for you. I can connect you with them. They may reach out or someone will kind of get in contact with you because we, we really will at that point. We really will. Um, make sure you just refer them at that moment. There's so many things happening so you don't need to carry that load. Just like Tandra was saying, like, care without caring without caring. Do that. Because if you're taking out all those things at once and telling you, you still got, what, like, maybe 200 other students you have to worry about, too? You can't carry all those loads. So hand it over to those of us who are prepared to handle that load and give them the support they need and help navigate them to the next spot where they need to go. Um, Another thing that concerns me about you all, or concerns my team. Friday afternoon. Ooh, I was about to say that, Martha. Um, I like to call this the bomb drop on Fridays because <laughs> what happens, especially, mm, it's 2 o'clock. It's going to happen soon from another department, not you all because you're right here. Um, what's going to happen in about two hours, um, a lot of other departments are going to call 
or email or some referrals about a student say, you know what, the student disclosed to me that they were having thoughts of suicide. I'm like, oh my goodness, when? Yeah, it was Monday actually. Um, I was kind of busy, so I just thought I'd tell you all right now so you can get on it. So one, it concerns us because now we're like really concerned about that student. Like more, more importantly, it's just like, okay, now we gotta get to them. We gotta call them. Are they on campus? Are they off campus? Are they still here? Has anyone seen them? So there's so many things that are going around so fast and with just a team of five, including myself, like sometimes I'll reach out to like my case managers who are lovely. They're sitting in opposite sides of the audience today. Um, we're like running, trying to get a hold of that student. We're calling housing. Hey, have you seen Jasmine Tiro in room 504 in Raven Rocks? No? You know, have they swiped in at all this week? No? Okay, great. Okay, great. And we're trying to figure out the next steps. Like, okay, what do we do from there? Like, who else we need to call? It's gonna, it's gonna escalate now into a wellness check where we get the police involved. Like, there's so many things. So that bomb drop, it hurts all of us. It, would, it could hurt that student because sometimes it's it could be too late. If you sat on that information for five days, we don't know what we're about to run into now. Because now we're concerned like, oh my gosh, we're going to the weekend. We're off at five o'clock. Yes, work does end at five o'clock. Um, but sometimes it may take us a little longer to end that day because now we're trying to get a hold of that student or their emergency contact. Are they missing now? Where are these other things are happening? So there's so many other layers that go into it. And we're also concerned that you sat on the information for five days and you were kind of thinking about like, what should I do with that? Should someone know? But then if I don't tell someone, it's on my conscience if something does happen. So then I'm concerned about you holding on to information because I don't know what could be a trigger for you in your life. We don't know what you've been through as an adult, um, a child, a teenager, any of those things. And those are so important to understand to like the whole picture. Because if you're holding on to that, now I'm also thinking like, should I also refer you to Tandria? Do you possibly need additional support too? Because a lot of times in case management, we're not only educating like parents that call us, but sometimes it's uh, faculty. Sometimes it's friends who want to refer a friend. And it's just making sure that everybody understands, like, hey, we're all in this together, but let me explain how we're going to navigate this right now and how you have played a role in this and what's possibly going to happen. And I can't make any guarantees, but it's just more so we're just trying to figure out, like, what's the next best step from here. So I'm concerned that you all carried a big load. Please don't hold that to yourself. There are so many things going on in this world today. Um, a lot of our students are carrying issues that maybe you hadn't even thought of when you were a student in college either. And that is a huge piece. It's so easy to say, like, you know, when I was in school, you know, we just had this and that. And I catch myself doing that, too. You know, it's, it, things were a little different then. But things are very different now. So think of that. Don't always compare yourself. It's not apples to apples. It is now a pomegranate to a jackfruit, and it is not the same thing at all. So make sure that you are doing your due diligence by giving them the care they really deserve and that they need overall. Thanks, Jasmine. Last question. Go for it. <laughs> when and how should we make a referral to case management, and what will we be told after that referral? Of course. So when and how? Um, when? I think I kind of adjust that a little bit. If it's a severe concern, it's a serious concern, you know that student needs support, refer them on our beautiful case management website, casemanagement.appstate.edu, to be exact. Um, there is a section on how to make a referral, and there's a care and concern referral form on there. So on that form, you can actually share as much information as possible, and it helps us a lot if you give a lot of detail about what the students said, what they're navigating, what you've observed. That helps a lot, and that form goes straight to us. As a matter of fact, it goes straight to myself, as well as my uh, case management program specialist, Leonie. We see those immediately. So I know sometimes people panic like, oh my gosh, I filled out this online referral form. I should call them too. I'm going to call them. And you know, I'm going to email them. I don't think they got my referral. I'm going to email them too. And you know, my two other colleagues, we saw the same problem. I'm going to have them email too. Okay, first of all, now you have used up almost an hour, 30 minutes or so of our manpower just looking through these things. Because now when we got that first referral, we're like, oh my goodness, yes, we're on it right now. But then we got like four or five more touch points that we have to navigate. Or now we got a phone call that's going to last 40 minutes because you want to basically read me what you sent on that referral form. And I'm like, 
listen, I appreciate you so much, but I have a job to do right now, and I got your referral form, and it's the same exact thing that you're telling me right now, and you're holding me up from getting to that student who really needs somebody right now. Please let me go. And please tell your friends that it's been helped, it's been uh, taken care of, and we appreciate you so much for sharing this information. Um, aside from that, like I said, those multiple touch points, they kind of slow us down a little bit. So if you just kind of pick one and go for it, perfect. Use the online care and consent referral form. That's our number one choice. Calls are great, too, if you choose a call instead because you're just like, I need to talk about it. I'm not sure. I think you all would take this, but it seems kind of an odd situation. Cool. Call me. Um, otherwise, you can also send the students straight to our office. A lot of times we get students who show up and they're like, okay, I don't really know why I'm here, but my professor told me to come. I'm like... Okay, they probably saw something. You Do you have a few minutes to share with me what that may be about? Or do you want to just kind of make an appointment and we can kind of discuss it then? They're like, yeah, I think appointment's good. Uh, just having some life problems. I'm like, cool, we can talk about that. Um, but what will you be told after that referral? Mm, nothing. Okay, listen, there are 20,000 students on this campus. And that's including actually the ones who are actually not here. They're the distance learners. But they still come to our office too. So you'll be told nothing. Okay, I want you to understand why. It's because you are very important, but so is that student. Okay, if I have to go back and tell you everything I told that student, you're slowing me down. You are now slowing us down to getting to the root of that problem. Not to mention um, FERPA. That's right. You don't need to know everything. It's really on a need-to-know basis. Unless that student told me, hey, I want you to tell my professor, Martha Markin, about what we talked about here today because she knows me, but I feel like if you told her, she would understand it better. Then I'm like, okay, cool, I can do that. But other than, unless they told me that directly, you're not getting an ounce of information. Just know that, hey, thanks so much for referring. It's been handled. I appreciate your partnership with all this. Um, but aside from that, too, I mean, there are other moments where I may get, we may get a referral in our office and it doesn't meet our threshold, and that's where it would go to Martha. But then sometimes it would not even go to Martha. Sometimes you may get a rare instance where we may reply and say, hey, thank you so much. Actually, just by reading what was said in that referral, um, how about you just ask these two questions? Ask them how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then ask them, do they need anything? Like, we may give you like a little like educational type prompt as far as like what to do or what to say to your students because sometimes they just want to like talk to somebody for a quick moment. Sometimes they wanted to just kind of share something briefly, but they don't necessarily want to be referred somewhere. You're their person and they trust you more than anything. You all have that basic rapport, especially if it's a small classroom. They feel more comfortable with telling you things than they would myself. So those are really important things to keep in mind. Um, also, after that referral, what else would you be told after a referral? Um, like I said, only if the student were to really clarify what they want to be shared, we would share some things with you. Other than that, we really encourage you to follow up with the student afterward. Talk to them. Ask them, like, hey, you know, you're okay now? Like, how did things go? Was, was that kind of a great resource? Or were, were you looking for something else that I could have helped you out better with? Um, that could be a great touch point for you all just to kind of, like, keep that rapport going. Because another thing, when you do make a referral, and if the student were to ask, like, hey, who sent me here? Or who, who told you about me? Obviously, we didn't grab this information out of thin air, not a fairy godmother. There's no way I would have known that mom and grandpa were having an issue back at home and they were fighting, and I just happened to hear it. That's impossible. Double A, I'll, I'll have to tell them, like, hey, you know, your professor, Helen Brooke, told me about this. They're like, oh, okay. I do like her. She did tell me that this was a good place to come to. So, okay, I'm okay with that. Because sometimes if they ask, we have to tell them we're very transparent. And it helps us with gaining that trust from students. So a lot of times they're not sure if they want to come or talk to us. But since we're a private uh, resource, they can utilize us as much as possible. And when I say private, I want to clarify, too, because I understand that, like, the counseling center is confidential. We are private because we are kind of on a, like, a need-to-know basis. So I will share information with Martha or Tandria, Kira, Jordan, and Chris if I need to. If it raises to that level where I need more involvement and more help, we will share that information freely amongst us. Um, but just know that that's kind of how that kind of goes into play. Um, also, one last thing to remember is that even if you do refer a student, um, my office is not mandatory. 
so that means that if you refer them and we do reach out to them and how we do we reach out via email first so we'll send a letter like hey you know I'm Jasmine and I'm a case manager in the office of the dean of students your professor told me you're having a hard time academically and kind of personally lately I wanted to check in and offer you some support I send that letter twice and also there's a text message that goes with that too just saying hey you got a letter from the office of the dean of students do not reply um, they will get that as well but it's also optional so if they choose not to respond or engage with us there's not much more we can do. Um, now, there are some instances where we understand it's a very serious situation and we're going to try our best. To be like, we really got to get them here. Start calling them. Email, call. Like, sometimes we're doing a little bit more. If we know they live on campus, we reach out to our friends in housing. Like, hey, I really need someone to lay eyes on this person. And let them know I sent them, like, two emails. Thank you. You know, just trying our best to get in a hold of some of them because we understand that there's an issue happening that it is escalating. But we really need to get them in front of somebody as soon as possible so that's pretty much it for the most part just understand that it is voluntary but we do try our best really really do we care about students and we want to see them strive and succeed and really graduate and be the person that they knew they could be the entire time it's just it's hard you come to college and you have these expectations and these ideas that you're going to just succeed and like keep that 4.5 cumulative gpa you had in high school and reality you're hitting that 2.1 and you're like this is not what i thought and we want to see them succeed college is hard life is even harder so just kind of remember that and have that grace with your students because we're dealing with the same thing too when they come to us we're trying to help them understand how life is working as a young adult and how it's not always fair but also not interrupting with natural consequences but also teaching them that there are ways to rise above these things that are happening to you thank you jasmine all right, Chris, last but certainly not least. Um, Chris is the director for Counseling and Psychological Service Center, where the students go for counseling. He's also a licensed psychologist. He's been in that role for I don't know how many years. Uh, director for about almost eight years. Eight years, yeah. yeah. So um, Chris has got a lot to say about the students in the counseling center, so please couple of questions for you um, what do you think we need to know is a good way to start okay well thank you thank you Lauren and thank you everyone for inviting me to be part of the panel and thank you for all the work that you do with students we hear about it in the counseling center we know that the care and the kindness that you show students it makes a difference beyond what you can even imagine so even just a brief conversation um, can really make a really big difference for our, a lot of our students so thanks again and um, I think that what do, what do I think that you need to know? Uh, mental health is such a big, uh, all-encompassing term sometimes, and and uh, we know that we have 20,000 students, and there's so much variety of needs. And mental health, I think about as a continuum, um, and we know that that's the case. And and so part of what we've done in the counseling center is built out a continuum of services that meet a variety of different needs, because we know that students have um, so many different types of needs, um, and needs to access assistance in different ways at different times during their college career. So I hope that um, today I'll share just a little bit about some of those resources that will hopefully uh, be a benefit that you can share with students or help students connect with. Um, also, um, just knowing that we are here to support all of you and the work that you do in your uh, supporting students. And so uh, we know that there are sometimes very tricky situations or we, uh, you just may not know how, how exactly to help someone that you might be concerned about. You're welcome to call us. Um, we consult a lot with uh, faculty and staff across campus, and so know that um, you can give us a call and we will uh, have one of our counselors talk with you. If not, we try to be able to talk with you right away, but if uh, sometimes everyone ha happens to be in a meeting um, or talking with, working with a student, so we will work, though, to call you back and try to help you sort things out or help give you some suggestions about how to support a student. And then we're also, also helpful or willing to come to classes or our mental health ambassadors come to classes even just to do a 20-minute presentation to your class if you think it would be helpful to hear directly from us about uh, for your students to know about how to access our services or what we might offer um, so those are a few things that I wanted you to know up front and we'll uh, get into a little bit more as well Oops. 
Um, when and how should we help students connect to the Counseling Center, Chris? Okay. Uh, well, we think about, I mentioned the continuum, and so we know it's a lot easier to assist students when problems are smaller. So we don't mind, we don't have to wait until things get really severe before you recommend or suggest that they connect with the Counseling Center. And um, I'll tell you about some resources that, um, you know, again, related to that continuum. But a lot of times we think about how do students connect if they might be interested in counseling or they think that they might be interested in counseling or some um, some services that we offer. And so um, the easiest way um, to connect with our counseling center is through what we call our initial consultations. And students can um, call us or they can stop in and schedule an initial consultation. Uh, those uh, we schedule that students can usually get those appointments within one to three days um, and it's a brief meeting we usually talk with them over the phone uh, for about 20 minutes and really get a sense as to what their uh, what is happening for them what their uh, needs are and then we can offer different options that might best match up with what they want and with what they need uh, and uh, so from that point then they might you might be familiar we have our we have individual counseling which a lot of people are aware of and so we can get um, can help them get connected. We offer short-term individual counseling. So average students use uh, about five sessions. Some might use less, some might use more, but we help students um, connect with individual counseling. And then we also have a variety of different groups, group therapy um, for food mood, for eating concerns, and LGBTQ plus uh, group. And we have a, um, several groups that we call understanding self and others and we know that a lot of uh, students and Jordan mentioned this earlier there's a, a sense of loneliness and disconnection even though they may have many connections on social media sometimes that in-person connection might be lacking and so we have a lot of groups that students take advantage of and we also have uh, some groups that we call quick access groups which are uh, meant for students to be able to get connected right away they're shorter they're a little bit more like a class usually two to three meetings uh, uh, for example, the two that we have running this semester, one is called Anxiety Toolbox, the other is called Kind Mind. And uh, we know that a lot of students carry a lot of anxiety, they have a lot of self-critical thoughts and um, that can interrupt um, their ability to really focus and, and do their best. And so uh, they can get connected to those right away, um, just first with an initial consultation and, and then that very week or the very next week with our some of our quick access groups. Um, and then I know that a lot of times people are concerned about what if there are things that are um, very more uh, more urgent, more emergency kinds of things, things like recent uh, suicidal thoughts, uh, recent sexual assaults, um, person might be hearing or, or exhibiting some unusual behavior or hearing things or seeing things others might not um, or have a, a recent loss or death of a loved one. Those are reasons why we might want to see that student um, soon, like same day. Um, or the student might feel like they need that. Um, if it's the daytime, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, when our office is, uh, is open and we're there, um, students can just walk in. They can let our receptionists know that they really need to see a counselor uh, right away. You can also, we have many uh, faculty or staff that will walk students over to the counseling center. I know, um, or or let us know, give us a call, say, I'm, I'm sending the student over. I really think it's um, an emergency. And uh, so we'll see them during the daytime. And then after hours or on weekends or on holidays, students can call our counseling center number and uh, they'll get our voicemail, but there's uh, instructions to press a number to be connected directly with the counselor on call. So that's available all, uh, always after hours, weekends, holidays, and we like students to know about that too because it's a really great resource. It saves lives when students um, can access that. Um, Jordan talked a little bit about sleep, and we know that sometimes uh, sleep, especially signif significant sleep disruptions, can really impact and um, uh, make more severe suicidal thoughts and when someone those often happen at 2 o'clock in the morning and so we want students to know that they can access assistance um, even late at night early morning so those are some of the ways that um, you might help students connect 
with us in the Counseling Center. Thanks, Chris. What resources can faculty share with students who might not want ongoing counseling? Yes, thank you. Uh, because I mentioned there's a whole continuum of resources. We have uh, what we call Let's Talk, and uh, that was a, a program that was first developed at Cornell, and it was geared toward helping students who might be historically underrepresented students, students who might really have never, it might not be part of their background or culture to access counseling, um, but it's, so it's getting outside of the counseling center, helping students to find counselors just to consult in a space that's, uh, you know, they might be more familiar to them. It's not meant to be an ongoing counseling, um, but it's meant to just allow students an opportunity to be able to even know what it's like to talk with a counselor, or sometimes they just have a problem and they they just, you know, maybe even talking for 20 minutes can make a difference for them and help them know what directions to go in. So we offer that four days a week. Uh, we are uh, two days of the week. We're in um, the International Hallway with Tauga River Room of the Plum and Student Union, um, which is right down the hall from Multicultural Center and LGBT Center and um, hopefully easy access for students. And we're also, uh, one day we're in D.D. Doherty Hall, which is close to a lot of support programs for students, especially first-gen students, um, students that might come from low SES backgrounds. Um, and then we also offer one uh, one day where we have, uh, have it by Zoom. So Let's Talk is a great resource to let students know about who might not uh, want ongoing counseling, but maybe it would be helpful for them to talk with a counselor and consult just a little bit. Uh, we also have have uh, something new that we launched uh, back in September. It's called WellTrack, and that is, um, you can access that. All of this can be, you can find this information on our uh, website, counseling.appstate.edu. But WellTrack has uh, uh, tools and resources to support mental health. It actually can be an app that students download, or any of you can download with an App State e um, at email address. And uh, so students really like uh, one, one of the app, one piece of the app is a mood tracker. And we have a lot of students that really like that. There's also vi short videos, professionally made videos um, on mental health topics. And so you are welcome to uh, show those video, show a video as part of a class to uh, give students assignments to to take a look at those videos, extra credit, those sorts of things. We hope that um, that could be helpful for all of you to access WellTrack. We know that students, not everybody wants to come to the counseling center, as Tandria mentions, and then that's totally okay. That sometimes for what. Lots of different reasons um, students may not want counseling through the counseling center. We have uh, something, and it's a button on our um, website called Thriving Campus, and that is an online directory of providers in the community. Scott Duell is our referral coordinator. He keeps that list current, um, and uh, but it's also it's not only counselors in the Boone area, but if you were to um, type in a different location, if a student's going home to um, in Virginia or Georgia or Tennessee, they can see counselors that are part of the Thriving Campus Network on that. It's uh, appstate.thrivingcampus.com. And so uh, even just within your office, if you if a student's like, oh, I don't want to go to the counseling center, but I do want counseling, you might point them toward uh, the button on our website with Thriving Campus. Can do a search based on um, insurance, about preferences for counselors, about the types of concerns that you might want to address in counseling. We have a lot of, we have also have a button that's related to self help, so a lot of good self-help information. We have some of that at our table um, afterwards. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, several uh, staff across campus uh, are getting trained to train in mental health first aid, and I wanted to mention that we have three of our three of our counselors from the counseling center are trainers. We have uh, others in the wellness center, wellness and prevention services, um, all, all across campus that can train in mental health first aid. And so, um, if you need any information or would like information about any of the mental health first aid trainings that are going on, um, you're welcome to get in touch with us, and we can point you in in that direction um, to, to or we can organize a training for mental health first aid. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, in the
the interest and out of respect for your time, I think we'll forego audience questions right now, but I do want to tell you several ways that you can ask questions of these panel members. And first is that they'll be outside or they'll have representatives from their programs outside, staffing tables with handouts and other information, so you can continue the conversations out there during the reception. Another way is that each of you who are here today and who signed up with your email address and registered, you'll receive the PowerPoint, which will have the contact information for the program as well as for the panel members. So you can ask questions of them next week if you want to do it that way. If you also have a question that you want to just funnel to me by email or ask me, I'll make sure that it gets to the person that you need to get your question answered. Chris, you also got me started on what are what are the next things that can happen and what are some of the next things that faculty, can, faculty and staff can do. And the first of those is to consider taking the mental first the mental health first aid class. It is an eight hour training. There are several instances of it available through the CEDLS website. That's the um, it's a big long counseling center for ex excellence in teaching and learning for student services. That's a great resource to get the mental health first aid. There's also um Jordan mentioned it. They have a curriculum and fusion workshop coming up on February 23rd called Infusing Well-Being in the Academic Curriculum. Those are two things that you can um, consider next. Also, there's a sign-up sheet, a couple of sign-up sheets here and out at the welcome um, table out in the atrium if you're interested in participating in planning any future mental health events, um, working with us in the Beaver College of Health Sciences about future events, just put your name on there, and I'll be in touch with you after the event. I'd like to thank the panel members for coming, being prepared, and having so much to share with each one of us. And I'd like to thank you for coming out to learn more about supporting your own and student mental health. Thank you. Thank you.